Para esta sesión ofreceremos traducción simultánea, inglés a español, español a inglés. Puede seleccionar esta opción en la parte inferior de su pantalla de Zoom. Si tiene dudas acerca de esta opción, le brindaremos asistencia. Si tiene preguntas para los ponentes durante la sesión, puede escribirlas en el chat de Zoom o YouTube. Por favor, recuerde mencionar su nombre e institución una vez escriba la pregunta. Al terminar la sesión, publicaremos la repetición en www.eventos.flar.net. Good morning. Hello, my name is Iker Subizarreta. I'm CFO at Fondo Latinoamericano de Reservas, FLAR. Welcome to this first edition of our second season of our Cartagena Talks. The prospects for 2021 are looking a bit better than what we lived through in 2020. However, it is clear that we still have to remain patient as the situation is still delicate. In the meantime, we keep leveraging these newfound remote work and collaboration tools that we discovered last year in order to remain in contact, effective, and above all, as safe as possible. As was the case in our 2020 Cartagena uh, Talks season, this is a space especially created to foster the collaboration and open uh, communication within the official institutions of our region. We are once again very grateful that you are able to make the time to accompany us once again. We hope that you're safe effective and in good spirits, both in your organizations as well as in your personal lives. In the midst of what remains a very challenging economic, health, political, geopolitical and social environments, we look forward to what seems, however distant, a light at the end of the tunnel. Our, our distinguished speaker today is Andy Blocker. In that spirit, I know that Andy will help us gain a broad perspective and make sense of a very fluid situation where every day it seems like the ground keeps moving beneath our feet. Andy Blocker serves as head of US government affairs for Invesco. In this role, he drives Invesco legislative and regulatory advocacy initiatives with policymakers, engages with clients and opinion leaders on public policy developments, and seeks to maximize the company's political footprint. Prior to Invesco, Andy was Executive Vice President of Public Policy and Advocacy for the Securities uh, Industry and Financial Markets Association. Prior to that, he spent five years as Managing Director for UBS of uh, US Office of Public Policy. He also served as a Vice President of Government Relations for the New York Stock Exchange as Managing Director of Government Affairs. And, is, and was an international affairs director for American Airlines. He also served at the, at the White House as a special assistant to the president for legislative affairs. Mr. Blocker earned an MBA in international business from Georgetown University and a BA degree in economics from Harvard University. We are very delighted and grateful to Andy and to Invesco for their support to this initiative that aims to keep us connected and to foster and open collaboration in a region, Latin America. I am very much looking forward to this session. Without any further ado, I leave you with Andy. Andy, many thanks for accompanying us today. The room is all yours. Gracias, Iker. Thank you very much for uh, that kind introduction. And I'm going to start with using a little bit of PowerPoint, but it will not be the entire session. So um, if I can use my technology skills here to bring that up. We will get started. Okay, I hope everyone can see that. And we'll go from here. Let's see if we can. Great. So let's just do a quick synopsis of where we've been, where we're and where we're headed here. Um, we um, I want to start with this. These are the job approval ratings for Biden coming into office. You can see that they're more comparable to uh, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, as opposed to Trump, who never um, got above 50% in his entire four years. But this is more back to normal of having a honeymoon where um, people on both sides of the aisle are giving you a shot. 
Um, as you know, you can see it's lower than it was for Obama and Bush and showing how divided the country remains even after the election with a number of Trump voters still thinking that um, President Biden uh, is not the legitimate president. Um, but despite that, and I'll talk about this a little later, um, some of Biden's proposals are still very popular, even more popular than his approval rating at this time. So if we go from there, um, we'll just look at what he's done. He's come out of the box pretty hot here, and um, he's done a number of executive orders. I've got some categorized here, whether it's COVID-19 or health-related, uh, climate, immigration, or just moving the federal government in a direction. So you can see we've got highlighted in red those that are um, – what we call just a reversal of what Trump has done. So these are part of his campaign promises that he would draw from the World Health Organization. He would stop that and reverse that, that he would rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, that he, that he would um, end the travel ban um, for people from Muslim majority countries. He would reverse and fortify DACA. Um, so you can see a lot of those are Trump related. However, you're gonna see more and more over time that in the future, um, less and less are gonna be about Trump and more and more are gonna be about his agenda. And as you can see here, most of those that are about his agenda are first and foremost COVID-19 related. The two key issues in the election were COVID-19 and the economy. And those are the two issues that you're gonna see President Biden focus on like a laser. He, those are the issues that got him elected and those are the issues that will potentially get him reelected if he chooses to, to run. So he is focused on the COVID-19 response. He's got the federal mask mandate. He's got um, extending the federal eviction moratorium. There's a number of things there, but that's the, that's the headline from all, all these executive orders. If we look at each of these orders in, in total, most of them are popular. Most of them are more popular than not popular. Some are very popular, the mask mandate during use of public transit, uh, extending the moratorium on evictions, um, just to name a few. Those are very popular because they're seen as directly related to COVID-19 and people really, really want to uh, win the battle over COVID-19. But when you move into those that are more related to immigration, you can see they're less popular. They still may be um, above water in a sense of more people wanting them or supporting them than opposing them. Um, but at the same time, um, some of them are not. So uh, expanding the refugee cap from 110,000 um, by 110,000 the coming year. That is underwater. Only 39% support, while 48% uh, do not support. Where, but including undocumented immigrants in the census, it's a little bit above water, but it's not overwhelmingly popular like some of the COVID-19 things. Uh, people have asked me, okay, what was the one thing that surprised you from these early executive orders? And I'd say that um, it would be revoking the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. I, I, I thought that's something he considered, didn't think he would do it day one like he did or in his early days. And so he did get some backlash for that from labor unions uh, saying it's costing jobs. And also the Republicans took advantage of that as well. But that was definitely a um, um, something for the environmental community. And so I'm not sure he's going to continue on that path, but he did make a statement when he did that. If you look at turning to just the fact that since the Georgia runoff elections for the Senate, where the Democrats picked up two seats to bring them to 50-50 with Vice President Kamala Harris being able to uh, break that tie, um, you now have Democrats controlling the House, the Senate, and the White House, albeit with slim um, majorities. Um, so what can happen in that environment? Well, the first two thing is like I said at the beginning, the most important thing is COVID-19 and the economy. So you can see my first bullet, what could happen? Well, what will happen is COVID-19 relief. And you're going to see people talk about COVID-19, these bills in different ways. But when I talk about COVID-19 relief, I'm talking about the $1.9 trillion package that's currently before Congress and will pass most likely before March 15th when unemployment insurance runs out. When I talk about COVID-19 recovery, it's really about that the next bill that's going to be attached with infrastructure and it's going to be trying to bolster certain industries um, that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, and especially in the in-person service industry, 
uh, and the travel and leisure is right in the middle of there um, in, 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 of that bucket. In addition, the COVID night, the, the uh, infrastructure part uh, will be the, the typical things for infrastructure, roads, bridges, transit, airports, and especially broadband um, is something they're going to add to that and also making um, things more green as well. Um, the one part of that, like unlike the COVID-19 relief bill that we're on right now, part of the cover recovery bill they plan to pay for. Not all of it. The latest numbers I'm hearing, it's very early days, but you know, upwards of 30% of it they would try to pay for. The part that's not related to COVID recovery, um, they, would, they would seek to pay for. Um, so the, the, the bid-ask spread on that is anywhere from as early as June trying to get that done, which I think is a little ambitious, all the way to uh, the fall. Um, and the reason people are saying the fall is because that's when the highway bill expires September 30th, and that's really more the deadline um, on that one. Also, other things that they can do on bipartisan basis, the retirement reform, I think China policy um, are things that, that Democrats and Republicans will get, get close on as well. Just to review the bidding here on COVID-19, we've already spent nearly $3.8 trillion um, on COVID-19 fiscal support um, through a number of bills. And um, so the $1.9 trillion would be on top of that $3.8 trillion. So there's been a robust response um, to this by the government, and I think you will see that continue. And then this is just an outline. You guys are very familiar with the, with the relief package I've been talking about, but the main thing is the $1,400 stimulus checks, extending the unemployment, minimum wage is a huge debate that's going on right now. The Senate parliamentarian is going to be um, deciding what to do with that today. Um, and because of some arcane budget rules, essentially, if it's what we're hearing is that if it's above $11, it's going to create a budget point of order. And if it's below $11, or if it's $11 or below, it will not. And that's part of the whole uh, budget 10 year window issue they have with budget reconciliation. So, for whatever it's worth, that's where that's at. And then, um, and then you've had all the different things fighting uh, coronavirus, and including money to help schools open safely, expand testing, help with vaccination distribution. And then the big part here is the state and local government, the $350 billion to help support them that is in here. And that is going to be, uh, that's a key part of, of, of this bill. Next, I will turn to um, the infrastructure bill. I've already talked about this a little bit, but we expect it to exceed a trillion dollars. There's numbers all the way from a trillion to four trillion. Um, there's a Biden's proposals, two trillion. Um, the House Democrats had a bill called Moving Forward Act from last year that was 1.5 trillion. So somewhere in the one to two trillion is where I've been um, putting my bets. But if it's done on a bipartisan basis, um, outside of reconciliation where you're going to need 60 votes, it's going to be on the lower end, one to 1.5 trillion. If they actually try to use reconciliation again as a tool where they only need 50 votes, you can see that number move up if it's Democrats only. So that's, that's a long-term thing, but we'll, we'll watch that space. Um, and then I mentioned to you that taxes will be part of this. So with taxes, um, having to raise some revenue for this, uh, the things first out of the block that they're going to look to do are corporate taxes. As you recall, with the Trump tax cuts in 2017, you had um, it removed from 35% rate for the corporate tax rate all the way down to 21%. Um, Biden's proposal is to bring it back up to 28%. Um, we'll see what the negotiations are. I think even some Republicans are comfortable going to 25 or 26%. But you're really to raise the money they're looking for that extra two or three percent to 28 is really what makes a difference. Um, and then also instituting a new 15 percent minimum book tax. Um, so it's essentially the equivalent of an individual alternative minimum tax to make sure that no matter how many deductions you have, you're going to pay taxes and quote do your fair share. So for any company make over 100 million dollars, they would um, have at least a 15 percent book tax associated with them. Increasing income taxes as well. Um, they're going to start with those over a million uh, to make sure that they go back to the top, former top rate of 39.6%. Um, I think it's at 37% right now. And so, and then also potentially eliminating the preferential rate for cap gains as well. Those are, are big money raisers there. Um, financial transaction tax is, we've been hearing is that that's being discussed. The only problem with that is that 
it affects retirement accounts, uh, both individual retirement accounts, pension funds. And so if they can find a way around it impacting that, they will probably have that as part of a pay for, but remains to be seen. Um, also here, I just want to talk about the uh, monetary situation. Um, well, first of all, uh, the, the U.S.'s speed and size of response, both on the fiscal side and the monetary side, was extraordinary. I think there were a lot of lessons learned from 2008, 2009 in the, in the, in the global financial crisis. And so as we're moving to the next stage of this with this fiscal stimulus on its way, there's been a lot of concern about inflation. And you can see here from that Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen, who were former colleagues at the Fed, are pretty much in the same space. Um, and that, you know, Janet's pushing that, look, the benefits will outweigh the costs. Um, and that, you know, this is the time to, to be bold. And uh, Chairman Powell saying, well, look, even, even if this goes swimmingly well and vaccines are distributed and the, con the economy starts bursting at the seams, he... I think the key word is he sees it as tran transient, that if there were any inflationary things would be transient. Uh, we would tend to agree with that. We can talk about it more later. But um, I think that bodes well for being more accommodative longer term. Um, this is just a recap of kind of where we are as far as the, as the balance sheet here and what's been going on with the Fed. Um, I, I don't see any retrenchment from this in the near term. I think the number one goal here is to support what's going on. And um, then also, if you look at the Fed, the Fed lending facilities, um, some of this, as you can see, the below the line um, on the December 31, 2020, those have all expired. So there's no more few new money going into those above the line. They're, they're, they're good until March, until March 31st of this year. So um, you can see that they're, they're still fully equipped just they were retrenched a little bit after they passed the last um, um, bill on coronavirus. Um, take a minute on just the personnel. We like to say that personnel dictates policy. We've already talked about Janet Yellen. I had the opportunity when I was in the Clinton White House to brief her or staff her for her first hearing when she was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. I feel like she's the most qualified person who could be in that job. And, um, and as well as some of the other folks here who also had government experience, um, the economic team is, is definitely laser focused on making sure um, there's uh, economic um, recovery here in the US. And, and I think you'll see that. Uh, the one thing is that Neera Tandon, who was um, the nominee for the Office of Management Budget, her nomination is uh, in jeopardy um, at this point with uh, Senator Manchin from West Virginia. Uh, a Democrat saying that she will not, he will not vote for her. Um, it's unlikely that they're going to find a Republican to replace that. So while she may not be the OMB director, she will, they will find another place for her in the administration to contribute. Um, then look at the National Security Foreign Policy Team. Once again, they're going with experience, old hands, people who've been in similar positions in the past and the people that uh, Biden trusts and knows. And so you can see us moving towards a much more methodical, deliberate foreign policy. Um, we're not, there's not gonna be you know, policy by tweet anymore. And so it'll give our allies and our adversaries a kind of a clear picture of where we stand. And um, so it's kind of going back to regular order there. And we can talk about that more later if you like. Um, industries that we've been looking at for the last year, um, leading up to election and even now are that things that would potentially be changed if Biden were to win. Fossil fuel industry with his commitment to, to climate is, is, is clearly one of them and the commitment to green energy. Um, healthcare, pharmaceuticals um, with um, one on COVID-19, but then also with um, him wanting to bolster Obamacare. Uh, building trades, construction with, if we've been talking about doing infrastructure for some time, we haven't actually gotten there. So um, I think we will get there this year. Um, it's going to be a lot tougher than people think, but, but I think at the end of the day, they will figure out a way to get an infrastructure bill and infuse a lot of cash into that. Um, and then technology. A lot of the tech companies are under a lot of scrutiny from both the political left and the political right, um, with some on the right feeling like they're being censored and some on the left saying, saying that you're not, you're not controlling um, harmful speech enough. Uh, so that's going to be a battle that continues. 
not sure there's going to be much done in Congress, but I do. But there are a number of cases currently um, lawsuits being filed by the Justice Department and then state attorneys generals. Um, and the, but they're mostly most of those are on the antitrust side. So then lastly, I've talked about this just a little bit, but I'll close here. Um, as far as foreign policy and trade and sanctions, look, like I said, you're moving from a very volatile situation where you had policy by tweet and you didn't know what you were getting each day. And so markets would react and it's like, oh, what does we mean when it was just something that Trump thought of and then staff had to catch up and implement what he, what he wanted. Um, and sometimes it was just a false alarm. So you're gonna move from that from a very deliberate measured approach um, that's going to be telegraphed. There may be even just um, leaking things to the press to kind of do a trial balloon. Does that work? But it's going to be back to regular order. There, you're going to kind of you're going to know um, where where America stands on things, um, and it's going to be pretty much um, um, you're going to know the direction. The and and the other thing is that it's going to be much more multilateral as opposed to bilateral, and um, really engaging with multilateral organizations and and with our allies. And then, but the, but we're still gonna go in the same direction, especially with China. So I think we've crossed the Rubicon with respect to China. Um, I do not see Biden reversing course on China. I believe that what's gonna happen is we're gonna continue to see, to look at them in, in, as an adversary, as a competitor um, and cooperate with them when we can, but, but, but to know that they are an adversary. And so, um, do not see the tariffs coming off anytime soon. Um, I do think that the Biden administration is looking for, they have to determine, okay, if we're going to remove those tariffs, what do we want in return for those? And once they decide that, I think you will see the tariffs removed, but it's, it's not around the corner that I can see. Um, so um, you also have the um, South China Sea, you have Taiwan, you have all these other issues, and you have a lot of human rights issues, which we really didn't pay as much attention to in the previous administration, but whether it's Hong Kong or, or, or any of the other human rights issues over there, um, you're gonna see Biden pay much more attention to that. Um, I don't think it'll be the same direction um, with Europe. I do think they're gonna kind of hold Europe to account, do their fair share with providing funds for NATO and things, but I think there won't be as much of a belligerent attitude towards them. And I think in, in Latin America, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a much more supportive, uh, co collaborative um, engagement. So I think that's all I have there. I'll stop sharing. And I guess we can move to the eager side of the show. Many thanks, Sandy. That, that was a very uh, thorough uh, review uh, of, of what, what to expect uh, from, from Biden and, and the role of the U.S. in the in the planet, I, I would like to to perhaps dig a bit. I know I know that there is a, a interest from the audience and and in general from, from the public about uh, local politics in the in the U.S. So you know the, the one, one perhaps two questions there. One one is uh, is, is Biden a one term president? Given that you know it was already in question him being seventy seven in for, for one term. And then he would be 81 for a second. And, and how, how would that look with Kamala or not or, or somebody else or that, those kind of uh, things? I know that there, there is a lot of uh, speculation at that respect. And, and in that, uh, a second question related to, to that theme is uh, the future of the GOP with, uh, I mean, I'm sure you have to, to say a, a lot to say about that and Trump or not and different factions. And, and that also relates to, to a question that uh, we, we receive uh, from, from the audience. Okay, so let me start with, with President Biden. Um, look, <laughs> President Biden's been counted out before. Everyone's saying he's a one-term president. He hasn't said that. In fact, the White House pushed back very clearly in the last week saying, no, he's looking to run for re-election. And whether he is or not, it doesn't matter. You don't say that you're not running for re-election because you immediately become a lame duck and people are no longer looking to you as the leader of the party. They're looking to see who else is running, who else can we get behind um, for 2024. So you're not gonna see him show his hand on that. Um, and I don't think, 
I think it would be bad for the party for him to say he's not running already because it would create a lot of chaos. So he, what he wants to do is he makes his, make sure he's he's getting the successes on COVID nineteen and bringing the economy back. We want to focus on ma- helping Democrats continue to hold power after twenty twenty two, and set up the next whoever runs, whether it's him or another Democrat, has a good chance to win in twenty twenty four. So I think that's the calculation there. That um, even if he wasn't planning on running, he's not going to tell you, and it wouldn't be smart to do so. Um, with respect to Trump, I think that um, it's very clear from every poll, from every action you see, that it is the Republican Party is a wholly owned subsidiary of Trump. And so it's overwhelming. Um, and so when elected officials, show um, deference to Trump, they're not necessarily doing it because they like him, they like his policies, whatever. It's because they like his voters and they don't want his voters turning on them. We've seen that many, many times over the last four or five years where if you go at Trump, um, his voters take it out on you. In fact, his first year or two, anyone who said anything bad about him was primaried and lost their reelection. So in the and so among Republican voters, it's it's still seventy percent, which is pretty high for uh, an approval post presidency, especially the way his presidency ended. Um, however, at the same time, you can't live with him. You can't live without him, but you can't live with him. So so to the extent that if you want to be an elected official and you want to run for president, there I don't think there's any path whether it's Trump himself running in 2024 or whether it's um, someone who's in Trump's image running in 2024, that is not a recipe, at least today and in today's environment, to be elected president. Um, Now, some of that depends on the performance of the Biden presidency, COVID-19, and the economy. But if if President Biden is able to do a fair job on COVID-19 and the economy, there is no room for a Trump-like character to come and defeat him. Okay, so so staying in the in the in the elections uh, front and all the all the damage done by by Trump's uh, claim on the illegit- illegitimacy of the the elections or, or or so on is is there permanent damage you believe or or will uh, will this get uh, you know? will be water on their breach at some point? That's a very good question. I think it's too early to tell. I think this is probably the most damage that's been done with respect to um, people not thinking that the elected president is legitimate. People thought that Trump was illegitimate on the Democratic side. They thought that the Russians helped him, and they, they thought a lot of things there. But the difference was that the candidate and the outgoing president conceded and acknowledged his presidency. So the leaders of the opposition party basically said, yes, he's the next president. They did not add fuel to the fire. So it's, it, you're always going to have your people on the left or the right, like not being happy that someone's elected and finding ways to not um, – support them or consider them illegitimate. What we've never had before is the president of the United States while still in office and even after office refusing to concede and continuing to this day to say that President Biden is illegitimate president. And so with that as the backdrop, I think this lasts a lot longer um, and could be a problem, but I think it's more of a problem for the Republican Party, like I said before, because right now, if you look at the approval rating for the COVID-19 relief bill, it's in the high 70s. And um, and 60% of Republicans are in favor of this bill. Yet the Republicans in the Senate are opposing it, partly because they want to galvanize themselves. But like there's still things that Biden is doing that is popular. And I think that's what he's focused on. He's not bringing Trump into the conversation. I think in his town hall a week or so ago, 
he didn't even say his name. I think he might have said it once, but he didn't really want to talk about it. So I think Biden's doing his best by use of the megaphone to move on. And I think over time it will wane. But in the Republican Party, there's there's going to be a civil war about do we keep Trump with us or not? Right now, he's winning that civil war. Okay, re related to, to that, one last question on the domestic politics. Uh, all these, you know, the extremes on in, in either party, the, the extreme left, if you will, progressives in, in, in the Democrats, and then all these, you know, the extreme right uh, in the Republicans, are, are they likely to be tamed and, and kept inside the party, or, or, or are we likely to see dissident factions uh, in either one or, or both of them? So, Iker, I'm sorry, I, you cut out on me. I could not hear that question. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Can you hear I, me now? I can hear you now. Okay. So the, the question is, uh, <clears throat> um, with uh, you know extremes in in both parties on the you know the progressives and the conspiracy theories and and the like, are they li likely to to remain in the party, or are we likely to see dissident factions? Uh, speeding off uh, from, from either one of them. Now, that's a great question, because if you see in other countries, I mean, there's not really two major parties. There's multiple parties um, in Europe and Latin America. Um, but in the U.S., they've stayed with the two major parties. I think for now, if I'm betting on this, I'm thinking you stay with two parties. You just wrestle it out amongst in, in, in both factions. I think it's easier right now for the Democrats to coalesce because they're in power. But when you're out of power, that's when it's really hard. And I think um, not sure how this shakes out. I do think that um, not sure what a Trump party would do. I mean, if you think about it's more of a cult of personality. It's really about Donald Trump and the way he does things as opposed to there's no real connecting – um, policies or positions. It's, it's more of a feeling. Um, and if you think about it, think about the Republican platform. So in 2016, um, when Trump was the nominee, he made some slight changes to the, to the platform, the, the different policy positions. In 2020, there was no Republican platform. They got rid of it. It was basically Donald Trump. I mean, that's, that, that should tell you something, right? So, so I don't, I'm not sure I mean, we talk about how old President Biden is, but Donald Trump's not, much, not that much, you know, younger. Um, and so how long does that last? And if it's really centered around him, I mean, I'm hard pressed to see who the personality is to replace Trump. Because a lot of people try to act like Trump, try to do some of the same things as Trump, but, but they get punished for it more than Trump. And um, partly because Trump had a 30, 40 year, um, brand from other endeavors where it was it was okay for him to do that and so he wasn't the typical politician but that's why it's hard for ted cruz or um ha senator holly from missouri or marco rubio or it's hard for them to to kind of take on that mantle so i think um going back to your actual question I'm not sure. I don't think there will be um, a breakup of the party, but I do think it will debilitate the um, the Republican Party for some time. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I didn't give credit for that question that comes from Carlos Alvarez uh, uh, from from Flar, and and then uh, staying in the in the domestic and, and then moving to perhaps uh, the foreign front. Uh, there's a question uh, from the audience. Uh, we we encourage uh, the audience to keep sending your your questions. Uh, there is Tamara Herrera from uh, a director at Synthesis Financiera asking how, how will the fiscal deficit caused by the reliefs related to COVID-19 be handled? How, how do you see these uh, dynamics? I, I would probably include there the, the, the balance sheet of the, of the Fed and, and, and so on. Yeah. Well, look, I worked in the Clinton White House when we balanced the budget in collaboration with the Republicans in 1997. We had three, four years of surpluses. So we're a far cry from that. But I do think there's been a change a little bit in the thought process on deficits. And I think Trump, interestingly enough, as a Republican, kind of just 
didn't have much of a care about it. He's like, look, I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to do the tax cuts I need to do. I'm going to make sure the economy keeps going. And I think the Democrats are, are on the same path right now. And that's why this COVID-19 relief bill will pass and potentially infrastructure as well. What do you do with the deficits? Well, that's a tough question. I think what the Republicans now are trying to rebrand themselves post-Trump as those who are concerned about deficits, that's part of the reason they're, the Senate Republicans are opposing this bill, saying it's too large. It's, we're not in the same situation we were back in March of 2020. Um, it's, it, we're on a road to recovery. So you can see some of that messaging come forth. I do think that um, there's a bigger, bigger belief, especially with rates so low and, and the ability to borrow is much easier. There's not as much of a pressing case right now. Because if you can lock in these lower rates for your government debt, it's not as big of, a, of, of an issue. But I do think it is something we do need to pay attention to going forward. I'm just not sure it's going to be a big part of the debate um, until we're fully clear of COVID-19 and the economy is fully recovered. And then I think you'll see the Fed kind of pay attention to this. Um, you saw what happened when Jerome Powell tried to deal with it and try to reduce the balance sheet um, and Trump started tweeting <laughs> and that reversed pretty quickly. So I think until we're in a full recovery, um, I don't think there'll be support for retrenching from the Fed balance sheet or to actually be dealing with the fiscal deficit either. Yeah, we, we get a, a couple of uh, reaction questions from the audience from, from uh, Mario Acosta and, and uh, Antonio Candia, one is uh, talking about age. Uh, what what's the role of uh, the, the the Democrats? Uh, the the uh, how would you say the the, the relief uh, pitchers, if you will, uh, you know, and the role of Kamala Harris going forward. And uh, another question is on the the, the median voter in the U.S. is shifting to the left. Probably they do not care much about the deficit, but inequality is their main concern. What other shifts in the medium term are, are you seeing going forward? That's a really good question. And I like the relief picture reference. It's as if it's Mariana Rivera. You're comparing Kamala Harris to Mariana Rivera, the, the best picture for the New York Yankees in the history of major leagues. Um, I think that, um, so I think that, though, I think Kamala, it has an opportunity to step in the gap with, if if Biden does not decide to run in 2024. But I think that's only – it's going to depend on how she performs as vice president. What What is her persona? Is she seen as um, – she has two jobs. She has a job to be seen as progressive enough and as, um, as, and, as not threatening enough to the center and the right um, to kind of – pulled together the same coalition that um, that uh, Biden put together. But it really it depends on, like I said before, it really depends on how we do in COVID-19 and, 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 ec and economy. Those are the key issues. It doesn't matter who the candidate is. Um, I think you, you also talked about uh, the new generation. Um, so yes, not only are they not as concerned about deficits, they're not concerned about socialism. It's like socialism in the United States has been a boogeyman term for decades, but that's mostly because it was tied to communism, right? And that form of socialism. And it's a Cold War. So I grew up in the Cold War and probably many people on this call grew up during the Cold War. And so it had a different connotation. It was more of a us versus them um, mentality. If you look at the United States, I mean, we're, we're not like Europe, but we're, we're there's a spectrum between capitalism and socialism. And we you know, through our great society uh, initiatives in the 60s and, um, you know, with Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, we do have a significant social safety net. Um, and um, it's, they're all pretty popular, um, especially when you're receiving those benefits. So I don't, I do think this new generation has a different view for some of those same reasons. And I do think that um, the other part is technology. There's much more, you know, you guys know this, they're much more comfortable with technology. My, my children or my son's going to be a senior at Georgetown and my daughter's going to be a freshman at Harvard. Um, they're so comfortable with these tech devices. I'm like, I'm the Luddite. I'm the guy. I'm like, okay, how do you use that? I, I used to know how to do that. Um, 
And um, but they and they're also more global. So my kids both take Mandarin um, and are not com- are very comfortable traveling, very comfortable. They, there's things that this generation does that just um, is was not as common as what we do. The world is smaller for them for all sorts of reasons. And so that, that makes me hopeful for this new generation that they'll be able to solve some of these problems. They're also much more concerned about environment, climate change as, as you go down the spectrum. So that's, that's gonna move that issue up politically as they become a greater and greater share of, of the population. Well, that's a, that's a great segue into probably the uh, uh, next uh, line of uh, questioning on, uh, on uh, uh, Biden and the U.S. Uh, going forward after all the retreats uh, from, from the global stage and, and so on from Trump and then Biden going back in, in, in this uh, direction. He's uh, you know, rejoining the, the, the World Trade, uh, the, the Kyoto uh, Initiative or, or Agreement and the uh, World Health and uh, NATO and, and, and so on. How how and perhaps you you can you can uh, comment on on his uh, views on on ESG and what we could be expecting at, at that respect uh, both in the U.S. and on a, on a global uh, stage. So, I think that's a great question, and this is probably one of the tougher assignments that this administration has, and I think that's why they've put in um, former Senator. Or former Secretary of State John Kerry to lead our international efforts and then have Gina McCarthy leading our domestic efforts on the environment, as well as some of the other seasoned hands at the different agencies that are going to impact um, environment um, um, and domestically. I, I think I'm just going to cut to the, the hard part about this. Okay, so um, the hard part here is the easy part is, you know, rejoining the Paris Climate Accord. The hard part is actually effectuating change globally in the climate arena in a meaningful way. One, it is good for the United States to do its part with its own policies um, to reduce emissions, but it's equally as important how they influence China and India to do the same. For we can do incredible jump incredibly in our efficiency and reduce our carbon footprint. But if we do nothing to influence China and India in that same regard, it's just one in and one out. And then if you add in emerging countries, emerging markets, uh, which are going to have to rely on coal and other sources of energy, I should say, rely on cheap energy, which is coal today, um, um, for a a longer run, um, you need to get as many of the players involved around the world to have that global impact that you're looking for. So my best hope is in, is in innovation and technology, continue to come up with things that are going to effectuate change. Um, if you look at General Motors and their move towards electronic vehicles, that's a huge step um, there. But even with that, even if we move to electricity, um, you have to think about, okay, how are you powering the electricity? So, I mean, so yeah, you've gotten really, you're moving away from the com- internal combustion engine, but you still have um, a large footprint to create the electricity um, there. So like, what are the new um, technologies there, which are gonna be um, not gonna require the, the production of that power from, from the different stations. Um, there's been a move more towards nuclear in the US. Um, I mean, we really slowed down our nuclear program after Three Mile Island back in the late seventies. I remember that vividly watching that. Um, that was a close to home event. And it, and it really uh, shuttered that progress. But yes, it creates the nuclear waste, but on the, well, but on the climate side, it, it, it's, it's considered clean. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, uh, another uh, kind of line of question you, you, you did mention in your presentation about uh, the adversarial role with uh, China. And uh, but what, one thing that comes to mind is, uh, and, and you did mention also that, that you're a child as, as I am of a, of the of, of the Cold War, are we in a, in a new Cold War in 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 that sense of different stage and different uh, weapons and and so on and 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 related to that, uh, I I do feel that uh, there is I would say confusion in the in the planet where uh, say Europe uh, or other geographies, particularly 
Latin America, knowing that uh, China is, you know, they, they're growing influ influence and also being their main client and the U.S. perhaps taking for granted Latin America for, for, for a while. So how, how, how is this uh, playing out and, and what impact or not, what, what the stance and actions of uh, Biden would be and, and his administration at, at this respect? No, that's a great question. Um, it's a very important question. So let me just start with just talking about Biden for a second. Um, I think President Biden is the person for this time, given his experience as vice president under Obama. Um, he uh, knows foreign leaders well across the globe. He was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This is old hat for him. Um, he specifically was you know, Obama's chief envoy to Latin America. And so he's very sensitive to the issues there. And I think he's one of the few people who can come in and step in um, and, and work and hit the ground running here. I think that, I think with respect to America's place in the world, I think that there was a step back by our moving away from multilateralism over the last uh, four years. And so we have some ground to make up but I don't think we can go back to the way the world was before. I think that uh, for a number of reasons, uh, diplomatically, but also because of COVID-19, China has grown in its influence. And I think the U.S. recognizes that. And while I don't think it's a, quote, cold war, I, I do think, like I said, I want to use the term that they are a, a uh, competitor or they are an adversary. Um, in, in that respect. And so we have to compete with them. And I think the first competition is in Latin America. I mean, we do subscribe to the Monroe Doctrine and that this, this part of the hemisphere is, is the most important to us. And we don't want any other world powers having too much influence in this region. But I think the price went up, right? The price went up over the last four years. Um, we're gonna have to compete for the hearts and minds in this region. And I think if you look at what Biden has done with, um, putting his first immigration bill, a big part of that is $4 billion for an interagency plan to address you know, underlying causes of migration in the region. Um, he's increasing assistance to El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. Um, and so there's definitely things he's doing. Uh, I think on COVID-19, um, you know, there might not be as much economic help on that, but there will be help as far as acquiring and distribu distributing vaccines. Um, and look, the region is an important economic partner. So getting COVID-19 under control is important to trade. Um, and um, look, we do have the soft power you know, competition from China and Russia uh, that I mentioned, but we think that um, in the long term, I think, I think we, win that, we win that competition. Um, I don't know if I answered all your questions, um, but I did my best. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I, I maybe maybe digging a, a, a bit into into that line. Uh, the the Trump campaign made an effort to portray uh, Biden as a as a weak, frail uh, person. And uh, what uh, in the foreign stage, what we're seeing is a China ever bolder. Uh, and then we also have these other rogue states, if you will, Russia and, and North Korea sabotaging and doing all their cyber and, and fake news and all these kind of uh, things, or at least uh, blame for, for that. Um, I mean, how, what, how do you view Biden making a stance or not, or, or what kind of style he's likely to, to apply uh, policies to, to implement or, or draw, drawing uh, lines in the, in the sand? You can also include in that uh, rhetoric the, the Middle East and and so on. So, so on the foreign stage, how what what would you expect from from Biden? So, I think he's already begun this. You can see he's really focused on rebuilding alliances first and foremost. He did early calls to traditional U.S. allies. He participated. He's participating in the G7 and the Munich Security Conference. He gave a very robust speech there, saying America is back. Um, and while skepticism remains, you know, you know, President Macron. His comments about Europe not solely relying on the U.S. for security, that's understandable. I think everyone, including the U.S., is trying to, trying to be, okay, we want to be multilateral. We want to rely on our allies, but we, but we want optionality and we want um, 
we want redundancy a little bit, right? You're not going to have just one trade partner or one military partner um, along the line. So, um, look, I think it really, and I, I keep coming back to this, I think the COVID-19 recovery and response um, is going to really impact America's ability to exert influence in the world. If we do not handle that properly, if we don't get our uh, economy back in order, it's going to hamstring us. Um, so with respect to China, like I've talked a little bit before, um, you know, it's, I think the areas where we really can co collaborate with them are potentially climate change and then coordination on COVID-19 and future pandemics. And, um, you know, all the trade and all the other skirmishes I've talked about, but those are the ways I think we can collaborate on them down the line. And then I, on the Middle East, I feel like we're really going to pull back. I don't, I feel like, yeah, we're going to work, we're working with Iran to see what remains of the JCPOA that Trump got out of. But I, I don't think us putting a lot of energy there um, because I think there's a fatigue when it comes to the Middle East um, right now. I think we want to be there to the extent we need to be, but it's not going to be our number one place, which I think leaves room for Latin America to be a much higher priority. Um, with North Korea, since you mentioned it, look, that's, that's a, that's a, that has, um, has well, I'm trying to think of the right word. It's, it's befuddled many a president. And even though I don't believe Trump was any more successful, at least he tried something new. But I think at the end of the day, it's clear that they have nuclear weapons and they have more and more capabilities. And I think the minute that they do some more testing, I think, of their nuclear, you know, capabilities, it's it's gonna it's gonna you know set off alarm bells, and we'll have to deal with it properly. But that that is a more of a um, a wild card. Okay, well we're we're getting close to the to the end. We only have seven minutes, and and I still have tons of questions and and some other questions from from the audience. So so maybe I'll I'll try to pack a, a couple of questions and finish with a, a question from from the audience. One, one uh, on the on, on Central America and so on. Biden did make an announcement on wanting to to have a, a, a stronger Central America. And, and, and while we were prepping for for the call, uh, we did mention that perhaps that's a more effective to build a, a way to build a, a wall than than than, than Trump's uh, approach. And uh, another question, trying to pack into 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 this is uh, winners and losers on a, on a global stage. Uh, so we have, uh, yeah. this did, did originate in, in China, but it was uh, controlled uh, fairly effectively, as has been the case in, in Asia, where, whereas in the rest of the world, particularly Europe and, uh, and the US, and obviously Latin America, Africa, it, it's still uh, wrecking uh, havoc. So uh, pro, pro, it seems like uh, Asia is, is coming out uh, stronger of, of this as a as a winner, if if uh, and, and then the West, it's a it's a it's in a you know weaker situation. What what would would your thoughts be about these two respects? So with Latin America, I think I just kind of reiterate some of this. I think this is an opportunity for Latin America and the U.S. I think Biden, um, with his knowledge of the region, with his commitment to the region, I talked about his immigration bill and what he's proposing there. I think. There is an opportunity here to engage and to see the common um, interests of both the U.S. and the rest of the region. And so, because I think as the rest, of the, I don't want to say as the rest of the region goes, so goes the U.S., but the way the rest of the region goes, it definitely impacts the U.S. You can't, the U.S. cannot ignore um, economic hardship or, or different things in the region uh, or, or, or political instability because it's going to it's going to impact us, and so I think the fact that Biden has spent so much time in this region now he's president, I think bodes well for that. I think the fact that there the U.S. is moving to um, diversify its supply chains and diversify um, um, and go back to more multilateralism is getting as many partners and allies as possible bodes well for Latin America. It's a it's a place ripe for that given the connectivity over the years. And I think the key is how, how we position ourselves and how we approach it. Um, and I, I actually see that, um, you, know, um, you know, being able to use 
given the fact that China is going to be trying to do a lot of investment in the region, you know, the U.S. using um, soft power in competition with 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 China and just being able to, you know, you know, China has the Asian infrastructure bank, but the U.S. could try to encourage both the IMF and the World Bank to invest in projects in Latin America to counter uh, the Chinese investment. That all, all that bodes well for the region. Like if, if people are competing for uh, for the attention of the region, that's good. Um, I do think people need to be careful. Um, I'm clearly an American, so I trust us more uh, long term. But um, that's enough of that commercial. Um, if we go to COVID-19, I believe that it's – China is the clear winner here. I mean, there's no other really way to look at it. Um, if you think about it, um, they have um, – it's accelerated the timeline for them becoming the largest economy because they've recovered much quicker from it. Um, and, you know, it's also not likely to be the last pandemic that we see. And so to the extent, and that's why I said it's good, it's, it's, it's important for how, and that's why I'm so glad that the president is so focused on COVID-19 recovery. If he's able to demonstrate we're able to with, with, with relying on science and with really putting in the full weight of the federal government to help the country um, recover, if you can get that vaccine distributed, if you can get things back on track, that's going to build confidence with our allies that we won't be debilitated in the future and that we'll be able to, the next time something happens, we won't be left on the sidelines. We'll be still engaged and not only be able to recover ourselves, but then to help our allies. Otherwise, people are going to look more and more to the people who are doing the best job. Like, which was clearly China this time. They definitely did a better job, but you know, I never count the U.S. out. Just watch us this year. I think I think we're positioned properly. Yeah, that's a that's a <clears throat> very interesting perspective. So so we we have time uh, for one more question. Uh, this time from from the audience. It's a copy from Andres Cabrales at the Central Bank of Colombia. The question is. How could the 2022 midterm elections affect Biden's agenda if he loses majority in Congress? And will Biden try to pass his most important policies before, before those elections in order to avoid that risk? That is a great question that shows a lot of insight. And I think you've answered the question with your question. And that is that he's going to try to get everything he can done, not just in the first term, but in the first year. And his most important things are COVID-19 relief and COVID-19 recovery with infrastructure, uh, because those are central to his ability to have a chance to, to hold Congress. I mean, he's, he's one of the tightest majorities in the House, and he's 50-50 in the Senate. And normally, historically, I don't think there's been a time where in modern history where you've owned, you've had all levels of government, at least in the last half of the 20th century, and, and then been able to maintain the House. Um, so the, the assumption is you lose the house. Um, so he's, they're trying to pack in as much as they can, but by doing that, it also gives them the best chance to get reelected because if the economy's recovered, if COVID-19 is going well, then when they go to the polls, they're going to have a good chance. And the other wild card is Trump. Trump being the major influencer in the Republican party, yet not being on the ballot is not a good recipe for congressional Republicans in the house and Senate. And so, if you have that, that's that's the formula for Biden maintaining Congress. If he does his job and Trump undercuts the Republicans in Congress. But we got a long way to go. So <laughs> those are some big variables. But yes, the premise of the question is correct. They are going to try to pack in everything that they can now. Um, and I think in these first two bills as much as possible, because the other bills are not going to be done with budget reconciliation. They're going to require 60 votes and they can be tough to get done. Okay, Andy, well, thank you so much. I, we have come out to the end of the, the session, I still, and, and, and we still have some quite a, a good number of questions, but have to, to wrap it up. So, so Andy, this has uh, been a fantastic session. Indeed, we are facing very complex and challenging times uh, ahead of us. But uh, as we all know, where there is uh, uncertainty, there's also opportunity. So many, many thanks for your insights uh, today. And, and once again, on, on behalf of uh, FLAR and me personally, I would like to 
to extend uh, our deepest gratitude to, to you, our guest uh, today, Andy Blocker from Invesco. And I am uh, very certain that they, these uh, insights uh, contribute and add great value to the investments of the public resources of our institutions. And uh, I would also like to very specially thank uh, all of our audience uh, today for accompanying us uh, once again. Uh, we are uh, preparing uh, sessions, very interesting sessions for, for this uh, season two of uh, Cartagena uh, Talks. And we hope uh, that you can accompany us uh, once again. Uh, so until then, uh, stay safe and uh, hasta la vista, amigos. And so many, many thanks uh, once again, Andy. Thank you.